Facts About Lyme Disease, produced in cooperation with the University of Connecticut Extension System and the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. This is the third video in a series discussing the invasive plant, Japanese barberry. In the first video, we discussed the plant itself, how to identify it, how it grows, it spreads, and its link to Lyme disease. In the second video, we discuss ways to control it by using a torch or herbicides. In this, the third video, we will further investigate the Lyme disease aspect by hearing facts about the disease, its history, and why it's become such a problem, how you catch it, its symptoms, available treatments, and the long-term prognosis for infected patients. In addition, we will also discuss, in detail, the deer tick, the tick that can transmit the disease to humans via a longer-term bite. The main way to prevent this disease is to keep from getting bit in the first place, and this video will give you the information on these ticks that you need to protect yourself and your family. Enjoy this video, and if you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact the experts via the contacts listed at the end of the video, or in the description of this video on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Hello, my name is Kirby Stafford. I'm Vice Director and Chief Entomologist at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And since 1987, I've been conducting research on the ecology and control of the black-legged tick, or as it's commonly known, deer, the deer tick, Exodes scapularis, which is the vector for the organisms that cause Lyme disease, human babesiosis, and human granulocytic ehrlichiosis here in the Northeast and the upper Midwestern United States. Lyme disease is the main chief arthropod-borne disease in the United States today. But it, it is a relatively new emerging disease. It was first recognized from a cluster of cases in the Lyme area back in the mid-1970s. But where did it come from? Well, Lyme disease emerged due to changing landscape patterns here in the uh, United States. If you go back to the 1750s, there was a Swedish naturalist named Pierre Kalm who came visiting the U.S. and he kept a diary of his travels and he noted then how bad the ticks were. Interestingly, a century later, the state entomologist of New York noted that along the route that uh, Pierre Calm traveled, hardly any ticks could be found. Where, what happened during those intervening years? Well, the trees were largely cut down for agriculture, the deer were hunted out, it's estimated in 1896 there were only 12 deer in Connecticut, and I suspect that many of you have that many in your backyard today. The current deer population is estimated at as much as high as 150,000 deer. And deer are a main host for the adult stage of this tick. So with the re-emerging of forests and with the exploding host population, including the small mammals as well, the ticks that survived on isolated areas on parts of Long Island, islands off the Cape, uh, were able to expand and reemerge. And today they range from Maine all the way down to northern Virginia, uh, where the ticks infected with these organisms are starting to make a presence there as well. So nationally, the number of cases of Lyme disease continues to increase uh, up to over 38,000 cases reported last year. Uh, nationally, and that's only probably about 10% of the actual diagnosed cases. So Lyme disease has become a big national problem. Connecticut has a dubious distinction of having among the highest rates of Lyme disease in the country, and this continues to be the case. Uh, last year numbers were down a little bit. There were about 3,068 cases reported to the Connecticut Department of Public Health. But again, remember, most cases of Lyme disease are not reported to the state health department. So it is underreported. Uh, the number of ca true cases is probably at least 10, 13 times higher than that. So given the number of Lyme disease cases that we have, the question comes up, what can people do uh, to reduce their risk of Lyme disease? And that involves reducing your exposure to the tick. What people don't realize is that a lot of the ticks that are picked up on the lower extremities and they crawl all the way up the body. They don't fly, they don't jump, and they don't drop from trees. There used to be, for a short time, a human Lyme disease vaccine, uh, but it is no longer available uh, and was taken off the market in 2002 for a number of reasons, primarily from a marketing standpoint. Therefore, 
personal prevention measures is your first line of defense. Uh, wearing uh, long pants tucked in socks, using a, an appropriate repellent uh, to reduce the chances of picking up a tick bite uh, has been found to be quite effective in reducing your chances of getting Lyme disease. When you come back and doing a tick check is also extremely important. It takes 36 to 48 hours for an infected tick to transmit the Lyme disease bacterium or spirochete to you. So if you find the tick in that interval, uh, you can reduce your chances of getting Lyme disease tremendously. A nymphal tick, which is a stage that's active in the summer, and you'll see some images soon, uh, is quite small, but it, it feeds for about four days for full engorgement and then it drops off. An adult female deer tick or black-legged tick requires five to seven days for full engorgement before she will drop off on her own. So you've got an interval time there to do a tick check and the best thing to do is to do a just careful check over the entire body. These ticks will attach anywhere and then with fine tip forceps gently but firmly grab the tick and then just pull it out. You can save the tick. Uh, the tick can be tested uh, for the Lyme disease agent but again if you remove it soon enough uh, you will have aborted the transmission process and won't get Lyme disease. Over the past six years, the experiment station has tested over 7,000 ticks submitted uh, through the local health department by the public. And of those, on average, about 25% of the nymphal uh, deer ticks or black-legged ticks, uh, uh, which is a stage that's active in the summer and the stage that most people get Lyme disease from because it is so small, uh, have been infected with a Lyme disease organism. Infection rate in the adults generally averages a little higher. Uh, we found it about 32%, but sometimes it can range up to 60 to 70% in certain pockets. So the infection rate can be relatively high. If the tick is, goes undetected, which it often does, or if it is found and removed too late and transmission has already occurred, of course you will end up getting Lyme disease. So what do you expect then? And the majority of people, um, about 60 to 70 to 80 percent uh, of people will develop the characteristic Lyme rash at the site of the tick bite. It's a slow expanding rash um, that appears anywhere from a few days to 30 days after the tick bite, but the average is roughly around seven to nine days. It's not the quarter size redness around the tick bite that's associated with the tick feeding itself. As the rash expands, it may clear in the center and take on a number of different characteristics. And this shape will depend in part where on the body it is. It may be warm to the touch, but it's rarely itchy. And so if the tick was feeding on the head or on your back, it's even possible you might even miss the Lyme disease rash. But that is a distinctive marker uh, for Lyme disease. With or without the rash, uh, most people will develop what we call constitutional uh, symptoms uh, or flu-like uh, symptoms, uh, fatigue, muscle and joint pain. Um, you just don't feel good at all. So any kind of case of summer flu, and I'm not talking no respiratory involvement, but just feeling really bad, you know, that Lyme disease should be something that could possibly be considered uh, as, as a cause. Yeah, without treatment, um, about half of people will develop some form of Lyme arthritis, which tends to be a migratory uh, joint uh, issue. Knees are commonly affected, although other uh, joints may be affected as well. About 15% of people will develop neurologic Lyme symptoms, which can range from neuropathy to tingling in the um, fingers. Uh, extremities uh, all the way up to some central nervous system uh, symptoms uh, as well. But one of the earliest neurologic symptoms is Bell's palsy, uh, which is a spirochete affects uh, uh, nerves uh, that control the muscles in the face. You'll get drooping of, of the face muscles. So that, that's kind of characteristic uh, and highly suspect for Lyme disease. About five to eight percent of uh, infected people will develop uh, heart block. Uh, so that's another symptom of Lyme disease. It can be quite debilitating and early diagnosis and treatment is uh, the best thing. Uh, if caught in the very early stages, an appropriate course of antibiotics prescribed by your physician 
will, in the vast majority of cases, take care of it, and that'll be it. Unless you get another tick bite and get reinfected again, there's no uh, lasting immunity, um, you know, to the infection. So you can get Lyme disease multiple times. One of the uh, big, other big questions that comes up is the diagnostic testing for Lyme disease. The diagnostic tests are antibody tests. So what the tests are actually measuring is your immune response to the infection. So it takes four to six weeks to develop sufficient levels or titers of antibodies uh, that can be detected by the tests. And generally, for most people, the tests are quite good. But again, you have that time interval where you can have all the classic symptoms of Lyme disease, the rash, muscle and joint aches, fatigue, and still have a negative test. One of the biggest problems sometimes is the test is given too soon. Um, so the di diagnosis of Lyme disease in the early stages is largely a clinical diagnosis by the physician. But again, early antibiotic treatment is uh, important to preventing the, uh, any of the later symptoms that you may have. Now the pr other way of pre uh, preventing Lyme disease is to control the ticks in your property. And there's a number of strategies that can be done uh, to do that. You can apply uh, ornamental turf insecticides, which provide very good control. You can provide, uh, alter the landscape uh, somewhat, clearing leaf litter, putting in landscaping barriers to reduce the number of ticks in the areas where the family spends most of the time. But there's also been a lot of work that's been done on targeting approaches at deer, which is the main host for the adult stage of the tick as well as things like bait boxes targeting the mice and chipmunks which are the reservoir for the Lyme disease agent and also the major host for the immature stages of the tick. Some of the more recent research done here at the experiment station has also involved barberry. Uh, barberry control has been shown to reduce the number of ticks in the forested uh, environment as well because that environment provides an ideal habitat for its hosts as well as the microclimate essential for the tick. This tick requires the kind of high humidity you find in the leaf litter in the forest floor for survival. So all these approaches can help reduce the number of ticks around your property and reduce your chances of a tick bite and getting Lyme disease. And a lot of these methods are summarized uh, and outlined uh, in my tick management handbook, which is available on the Experiment Station's website at www.ct.gov slash C-A-E-S, and there's a little button that'll direct you to the Tick Management Handbook, which outlines a lot of these control methods that uh, you can use.